Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast, brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, we got Mark scrolling through his iPhone here, and a special guest, though, more importantly, is Josh Fralick with us in the room. Hey, guys. On the pod here, we've got Jimmy speaking, Mark on the iPhone, uh, Josh, like we said, and Ruben joining us. So, And I'm on, uh, I'm on the Yeti. Exactly. Mark and I'm my not I'm not on my iPhone in like a disinterested way. I'm researching. Good. All right. So Mark and I will ask relatively naive questions about multi gun, all the red dots on Josh's uh, rifles and shotguns, them. and then also some world shotgun championships too. Rube will be clarifying and ensuring that people from the outside don't think that everybody at Vortex is completely naive to uh Three gun and things like that. I like that, that I've earned, I like that I've earned my nickname now on the show. What is it? Rube. Rube? Yeah, dude. Like oh, yeah. you you always call me Ruben. You asked us to say that, Ruben. <laughs> <laughs> Does that really mean he earned it then? <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's uh, dive uh, let, let's dive in here. How about? Let's do it. So Josh, thanks again for joining us here. And oh, yeah. so we had okay, there's a lot of questions that we were talking about before we hopped on here. Where do we start? How about we start with you introducing yourself a little bit. For those of you who aren't familiar with Josh, you can follow him on Instagram at Josh... Underscore Freilich. Underscore Freilich. How do you spell Freilich? Because otherwise I would have said Froelich. Yeah, I get it. F-R-O-E-L-I-C-H. Perfect. So you can follow him there. And don't do it while you're driving right now if you're commuting. But what's the high-level Josh Freilich introduction? Uh, High-level. All right. Well, competitive shooter. Uh, I love to go fast with guns. I mean, that's pretty much my MO. So I spend as much time during the course of every day possible that I can do just ripping on on guns. And so uh, it's led to uh, just a passion for the action shooting sports and really a passion for really good gear. Because when you go fast and you, I don't want to tinker, I don't want to mess with guns, I just want to shoot. So over the course of about five years, really fell in love with with competition shooting and action shooting. Is that what they mean by ghost gun? Ghost gun? <laughs> oh, whoa, where'd you get that? I don't know. Well, yeah, so know. we were talking about gear, and gear is something that comes up. You run open class a lot, right? Yep, yep. open and division. For those not familiar, there's there's a couple of different classes or divisions that you can run in multi-gun, right? right. There's tac ops, there's open, there's... Limited. Limited, okay. Heavy. Heavy. And then there's like heavy limited and stuff like that, right? Yeah, there's some subdivisions within those, within the heavy division, yeah. All right. Open is basically the one where you can do anything that you want, right? Pretty much. You can kind of run anything. Pretty much, yeah. The rules are off as far as gear restrictions for the most part. And uh, what that allows us to do is just maximize capacity. So our mags are loaded all the way up. We run big mags too. So, you know, 30 rounds in a pistol. 50, 60 rounds in a rifle, 20, 25 rounds in a shotgun, and, uh, you know, optics on everything, like all kinds of optics on everything. Yeah. Did, I just, think they should rename that to the Freedom Division. <laughs> freedom. <laughs> it is free. Does somebody yeah. get into open? <laughs> what, what made you choose open? Was it because of all the sweet gear that you get to use? And, like, I mean, if you guys follow him again on Instagram, I mean, you're going to see crazy-looking shotguns with, like, banana clips on banana clips. And Yep. Yep. Somebody's going to yell at us for saying clips. Right? <laughs> I know it's a mag. You can't say banana mag, though. It doesn't sound no, right. It doesn't yeah. sound no, it's good. A, oh, it's, a, it's a banana magazine. Right. It's a magazine, but if it's a banana magazine, it's, it's a banana, a banana clip. clip. Anyway. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. But you're doing that. You're running guns with like two red dots on them. Have you ever run with three? I threw it on and I was like, it actually doesn't help. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a reason to the two. Right. Uh, right. But. Yeah, I originally got into open division uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I tried some of the other divisions, and I was a USPSA shooter, which is action pistol shooting, and it's a drag race. So you can run 32 rounds in 8 to 12 seconds on those stages, right? So it's fast shooting pistol. And I came over to multi-gun, and I had a Benelli M2. It was all tricked out, really nice gun for tack op, and was slamming a couple of rounds in it and standing still. I was like, man, I just want to shoot. You know, I don't want to be loading this thing. And, and I wasn't great at loading quads or anything yet, but I could do it. Mark's a big fan of Benelli M2s. He was just fist pumping over here. I, I did notice that. that that's my go-to. <laughs> Is but it? From more just hunting perspective, that's the gun I've been running for a while. Yeah, yeah. It's solid. I actually bought one last week. 
I haven't bought a gun in a long time, and I bought an M2 last week for sporting clays and shooting pheasants, and uh, they are nice. But for competition shooting, for me, it just felt like I was standing around on the clock, and I didn't enjoy it. So there was a, a guy, a uh, local guy that ran open who had a shotgun that ran like a top. And I'd watch him shoot a stage and I was like, this is, this is dumb. I'm done. I'm going to get one of those and I'm going to go fast. And that's what I'm going to do. And so I uh, originally just got the open division shotgun, 20 round mags, and uh, ran my same uh, iron sighted pistol for a while and ran the same rifle that I'd been running for a while through another dot on it. But you know, naturally, yeah, well, that's what you do, right? Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was the start of open division was just, I didn't want to stand around when the, when I was on the clock, you know, I just wanted to shoot. Now, before shooting, you have a background that involves competition. Yeah. Go into that a yeah. little bit. <laughs> well, I always love to compete, man. I always love to compete. So, uh, in school, uh, I liked wrestling a little bit, you know, that was fun. Uh, football, I love football. And, uh, you know, I started causing some trouble for a few years. And so I didn't, you know, go into college sports so much. But then uh, decided that I would get back into athletics and went into MMA for a few years. So I fought pro MMA for about four and a half years. Uh, helped to pay through college, you know, by training people and fighting. And, you know, so that was, again, go fast. It's all about adrenaline spikes and, and going head to head competition. And so uh, I loved that game until I got into uh, professional, you know, sales, started my career. And was like, well, you know, sales numbers drop pretty quick when you have a black eye. <laughs> they, they just do, right? And you always have a black eye when you're a pro fighter. I think that would like, I'd be more inclined to buy something from the dude with the black eye because I know he's willing to go the distance. Yeah, well, you would, <laughs> but most people wouldn't. Like, this yeah. guy scares the hell out of me. I better buy something. <laughs> yeah, uh, immediately. Yeah, yeah. So I tried for about four months, and I, you know, I'm a super detail guy. So I had spreadsheets and all this stuff. And so I knew my closing percentages at the time I was in college. Uh, and I was actually selling cars on a car lot, learning just per basic sales. And my sales close percentage would drop about 30% when I had a black eye or a beat up lip or something, right? <laughs> so I was like, I will make 30% less money if I'm beat up when I'm in sales. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not willing to make 30% less money. And so I just, I, I gave it up. And so I was lost for a few years trying to figure out what to do that would get me fired up like fighting did and. You know, I, wouldn't, I needed something that was a head-to-head -head competition. And so um, business to business sales did it for me a little bit. You know, you go out and you, you beat your competition, you, you know, land a good commission or something like that. That was fun, but it wasn't quite the same. And so then when I found competition shooting, that was, that was the ticket. You know, I could go fast. It was loud. It was exciting. It was fun. It was a guy's game, you know, kind of. Plenty of women, mm -hmm. plenty of women shoot well too. But, uh, you know, that just felt like the thing to spend time on. So... Dude, Ruben, I'm glad you brought that up. I had no idea. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, once upon a time, land far, far away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a big softy now, but <laughs> 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 yeah, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we trained Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, and, and boxing, and had a bunch of real tough dudes. A couple of my old training partners are UFC guys, um, and they do real well. Yeah, if you shoot with Josh, we actually had a little early morning training sesh down at the Vortex indoor range this morning. When you say training session, are you talking about like MMA or are you talking about like shooting? Well, I was prepared for anything, but um, <laughs> <laughs> like lots of bubble wrap, bubble wrap with. So, yeah. Uh, but Josh and I are both competing in uh, Luke Soil PCC World Championship oh, yeah. this coming weekend down in Missouri. And so just making sure zeros are good, making sure we got reloads, sticking the reloads and footwork and stuff. So we, we had about a two-hour practice session this morning. Shot with Josh for quite a while now, but if you watch him shoot, you'll see the intensity. Like goes into that game mode, and it's it's lights out. So it's pretty cool to see. And and I I remember watching him shoot. Actually, when you were kind of just getting into it, and I was you know there's this intensity, this focus that most people that are just starting competitive shooting don't have. So it's at at that point I was like, dude, like how. Where's that coming from? There's got to be something. You see it with guys like <laughs> Scott Green with the baseball background. Yeah. And, and um, uh, there's tons of other people in our sport that have the, that competitive background in some sort of sporting role or they have a college athletics background or something. And you'll see certain people have that that mental focus and that conditioning that doesn't come when you're just like, hmm, I want to start competitive shooting. 
Yeah. It takes a while to get that for a lot of people if you don't have that background. Well, and like you kind of talked about, that can be tough to, if you're a person that's been involved in those things, like, you, you know, sports your entire life or, you know, college sports and, you know, maybe you don't make it to that pro level, which a lot of us don't do. It can be difficult to find that outlet, that thing that kind of fills that void yep. once you kind of wrap up those things. So it's cool that Absolutely. you found competitive, competitive shooting and that yep. it does fill that gap for you. Well, and it's awesome. So it, what, what it's cool for is really everybody. So you can be at a match, you know, I can be training or shooting alongside a 70-year-old guy that's retired, that just loves to shoot his old 1911, a 16-year-old kid that's learning how to shoot with his mom or his dad there, and they're competing, the weekend warrior that trains a little bit, and then four or five pros, and everything in between. So it's neat because whatever you're in it for, you can get it out of it, Mm -hmm. right? And so tons and tons of competition at the top level, you know, the top 20%, 30% at a major match are amazing, super talented people, right? They, they're totally committed. They train every day. They work hard. And then the bottom 30%, some of them are working hard too with goals of getting up higher, but some of them don't care. They just, they just want to shoot guns and have fun. And that's okay too. And so it's a neat sport because it kind of blends all of that and you can get whatever you want out of it. And you're all at the same match too. I, I saw. I think you. I think you posted something, or somebody posted something recently, where it's like a pro shooter, and you might be that 16 year old kid just starting out. You're at the same match as a pro shooter. Heck, sometimes you're in the same squad. Yep. And it's like you know, hey, you want to get any tips? How about a tip from a guy that's been doing it for years and practices every single day, and you just got into it? Like maybe even your first match, and you're right there with pro shooters. Yeah, it, this analogy gets used a lot in um, a lot of different talks in our sport, but I mean, it would be like if you decided you want to go play golf on Saturday morning and you were playing with Tiger Woods and he was like, hey, do you want to play this round with me and I'll just give you tips the whole time? Like that's that's what it would be. It's rare. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd venture to guess too, part of that, and this is not speaking from experience, I, I'll say, but but I'd venture to guess part of that like adrenaline kind of that high intensity feeling of competition too is why you see a lot of military veterans and, you know, police police officers and things like that in competition shooting as well. Yep. It's an adrenaline rush for sure. Oh Except yeah. I've done one. And I yeah, it's Did it's you like it? Yeah. Did, oh, I loved it. Well, where's number two? When when are we doing this? Well, we just gotta I, I don't know. <laughs> I, well, soon I, soon. Uh, okay. It should be soon. All right. But yeah, I used to I used to run track, and it's you you get the feeling when you know shooter ready. Yep, stand by. It's just like back when you're in the blocks. So yeah, we were when we were getting ready for the match that Jimmy shot. He well, you kind of had the tactical jog down, and Jimmy's a very fit guy for anybody listening. And so when we were kind of getting ready for his first match, we, I was like, dude, like you put a gun in your hand, you don't have to jog. Like you can sprint. Yep. you can make up tons of time. And Jimmy ended up finishing his first match and being in the upper, really upper third of shooters for awesome. his first three gun match at a major cool. match. Dude, that's and it was really because good. he honestly like sprinted between positions. Yeah, you get that hustle you know, on. You figure yeah. out what you're good at, right? And what I'm good at is not necessarily <laughs> shooting. So let's, let's we can make well, that. Clear. You didn't miss much. <laughs> other, you, you didn't miss much. I wasn't but, horrible. If you can just not be horrible at shooting and you can be generally athletic, you can do okay. But I think where yeah. a lot of people kind of go go wrong is that they're like you put a gun in their hands and all of a sudden it's like they can't move anymore right you know and that that was one of the things that we talked about and i was like dude you've been running since you were five don't tactical jog because there's a gun in your hands (laughs) it happens it Uh, happens in so many cases oh yeah i'll throw in the quintessential uh jimmy Carr reference here but you drive 80 miles an hour on the highway while you're eating a donut and like you know talking to your wife on the phone with one shoulder and steering with your knee then you go on a racetrack and you're going 50 and you like forget everything. <laughs> you're like, oh my god! Like it's like, okay, we uh, just have a left turn here and it's like, whoa, 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 how do I do it? How do you know? It's <laughs> all, all my life I've been told to not run with scissors. Now you're now you're telling me to run with guns. Uh, yeah, if you're comfortable, just don't put a bayonet on it and you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Okay, so now let's transition into gear a little bit because obviously when you're running open, there's a lot of cool gear. Oh yeah, I think that you get to run. Yeah. And this will probably dovetail into the, your shotgun world championship a little bit if the plan in my head goes according to to how I I got it planned out. But so let's talk about let's talk about your gun. Let's talk about the red dots first. Yep. Because I've been dying to ask. I was talking with Dylan Easley the other day, and he was reluctantly saying that he is now switching to I don't know if like permanently, but he was entertaining the idea of running more than one red dot. Yep. 
And like you said, it's for a reason. It's not just because it's not just to put red dots on. Stuff, no, just because you're an open. No. What's the reason? It's pretty interesting when he explained it to me. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it came down. It happened by accident. So, in open division on the rifle, we run a scope. So, uh, one I run a one to six raise on my on my rifle. Then you run an offset dot at forty five degrees, so that you can set the scope up at let's say three x because that's where I want to shoot everything at. That's 100 yards, whatever, maybe an offhand rifle plate rack or something. And then I've got up close paper. I just want to roll the rifle so I don't have to mess with the variable power on the scope. And so I was used to shooting everything up close with the offset dot around corners, uh, straight in front of me, 20, 30, 40 yards, wide open paper. And then I decided to start shooting this PCC game, so the 9 millimeter AR, uh, over the winter so that I could keep my rifle skills sharp. Right, because typically over the winter I would put the rifle away, I'd put the shotgun away, and I'd go shoot USPSA pistol matches indoor because that's all we could do. And I didn't want to do that, and so I just wanted to keep the rifle game sharp. So what I found was I put a single dot on top of the of the PCC, and I was like, why am I shooting these around corners and and you know tight positions through ports so slow? Couldn't figure out what what the deal was, and then I just realized when I was picking up my rifle one day that it's like, well it's because I'm running offset dot on my open gun. Uh, that's what I'm used to shooting around tight corners and uh, low ports and any of that stuff. It's just more comfortable. So the head position is more comfortable as I'm in a tight lean, right? I don't have to camp my head at some crazy angle to get around the corner. So I apologize for the noise, by the way. That is a dog uh, right behind me that is chewing <laughs> on a 30-round magazine. Oh, that's a dangerous precedent to set. Do you have like, a thirty-round magazine it's, in this room? Unused, <laughs> it's unused, so it's not. There's no lead poisoning going on here. But I'm more concerned that there's a thirty-round high-capacity magazine in this I, room. I know. I apologize. You it's really not, should have a sign on your door that lets people know that, Jim. That <laughs> beware of thirty-round magazine. Uh, not the so dog, much. Forget about it. Yeah, not so much the dog. Anyway, I apologize. The noise. The noise got a little. But anyway, like you're saying, so that that was one thing I thought it was interesting because I always thought I always thought you were running like two different zeros or something like that. No, well, and originally I thought about doing that too. I was like, well, I got two dots. Maybe I can just run like my normal fifty yard zero, and then I'll run like a ten yard zero. And what I realized very quickly was that requires you to think a lot when you're on the clock. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do is have any of that really mathematics or thinking on the clock. I just want to shoot by instinct. And so I look at the stage, I visualize the stage, I lock it into my mind, and when I get up there, I don't want to have to worry about this dot I hold two inches high, this dot I aim right at what I'm shooting at, unless I'm shooting further distance and I have to aim low. Like, that becomes this whole thing that I want to completely avoid. Mm -hmm. So I just run 50 yards zero on both of them. I know it's a standard AR holdover, and all I have to do is just shoot on instinct. I don't have to worry about where to hold. Perfect. Yeah. And so it's mostly those tight corners like you were talking about that you use the offset red dot on, even if you're yep. running a primary red dot. Yep. So you, you could be running two red dots, hence, the, uh, hence what we were talking about with all the dots. But what yeah. about your so shotgun? On your shotgun, is one of them a slug zero or no? Nope, nope. So originally... Same kind uh, of deal? Originally, yeah, that was the plan. I was going to do it that way. And then I realized even there, you know, 50-yard slug zero on both. And then I just will hold just a little high for the bird shot up close. But it, and the reason that I did that was it was, again, too much thinking because you end up throwing a miss or, you know, there's a tight no-shoot or something and you pick it up because you were, in your mind, still stuck on that other hold when you transition real quick. Because when you transition, you'll shoot one, two, three targets, roll the gun, shoot another one real quick, right? I don't want to think about anything. I just yeah, not a whole lot of time to think. No. Yeah, it, and when you think about it in your mind's eye, too, like the coming around a corner and stuff like that as well, it really makes sense because... If you have a dot on the top of your rifle, the top of your rifle has to come around the corner. Mm -hmm. And then you have to lean with it yeah. to the side. Yep. Whereas if you can just roll the rifle and your head stays straight up. Yep. Yeah. You, your center of gravity changes and like you have to lean harder. And I was talking to Dylan too about it because mm -hmm. I had not, for my PCC getting ready, uh, pistol caliber carving, getting ready for uh, this, this big match coming up this weekend. There's a bunch of us that are trying to figure out, you know, like what, what are the guys at the top doing? What do we need to do to, to make slight gear changes? And yeah, I think there's a bunch of us that have mounted a 45 degree dot next to a vertical dot and went up to a wall 
and said, dang it, that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other part Leg- is... Legitimately. You, that, you, that's... you keep the dot directly above the bore, too. So when you're oh, leaning yeah. hard around a wall... Your optical the, bore height changes, technically. It, it, yeah, it totally changes. It's not even overbore. It's at a weird angle. Oh, yeah. I yeah. guess it's just like even with... Because yep. bolts only drop up and down. Yep. Right? I guess down. I yep. didn't say up and down. So but. when you've got a small steel at, say, 30 yards, and it happens to be around a tight lean... Try holding the gun level so the bore is directly under the primary dot and a hard lean. It's very it difficult. Time. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's very di- Or you switch shoulders, which is fine. I know how to switch shoulders, but that adds about six tenths of a second when I'm in that position. And six tenths of a second, two or three times on a stage, puts me right out of the mix. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, not willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. For like a home defense rifle, would you do the same thing. Is that something that's going to get you killed in the streets? <laughs> <laughs> so, is, it off, uh, is, is multiple dots something that's... I, I'm just curious, you know? And, and of course, there's going to be 10,000 different opinions on yeah. this. And somebody, regardless of how you answer, somebody's going to be upset about it. But but I'm just curious. Yeah. Were what you, you trying think? to start a fight? <laughs> Dude, how many... So I'll answer the question in the only way that I can. To start a fight. The only way I can. My uh, home defense, 10 and a half inch... Uh, SBR that's suppressed has an offset dot on it. Uh, absolutely mm-hmm. does. Why wouldn't it? I mean, with all the reps I put in on the guns with offset dots, for me to have a home defense gun that was set up different would be dumb. Yeah. You know? And so for me, it makes really good sense. I'd probably switch, still switch to my weak shoulder uh, just so I'd have some wall between me as much as possible. That's fair. But in that spot, I w- well, however you train, that's the way your home defense stuff should be set up. Right, I was going to say, I mean, to your point earlier about thinking, if you're a person that has, you know, you know, PCC for home defense or yep. other, you know, if you're not running that offset, then you probably don't want to have that yeah. on there because mm-hmm. to your point, you're not, you're not going to be better with it. Yeah. Mark, Mark's going to go home it. and mount a 45 degree offset dot on his pump shotgun. Well, yeah. I'm going to have dots, dots on my dots on my dots. For your door kicking gun? <laughs> Big time. <laughs> He's going to build an AR. He oh, keeps going to see it. Mark, I had been... one, and then I sold it, yeah. and then I never re- replaced it. You can't oh sell something gosh. you never had. I have pictures of it. Unless you're on it. like Craigslist, then you can sell stuff you don't have all the time. I just sold it. <laughs> you're going to see it soon. Maybe two. Two? We haven't seen one AR in years anyway. But okay, so, all right, we've, we've talked a little bit about the red dots here now, and Ruben, Ruben alluded to the fact you do the same thing on your shotgun. Yep. Your shotgun isn't an ordinary shotgun, though. Right, uh, it's not just like it's not a Benelli M2, right? Right, right. yeah, it's a Malat Vepper, mm-hmm. so it's a Russian AK shotgun, and so similar to the Sagas that guys are familiar with, the Malat is like the big brother of a, of a Saga. It's a heavier receiver set, different gas system. It's based on like the RPK receiver. It set, is, it? yeah. So they slam a twelve gauge barrel in an RPK, basically. I mean, there's more, awesome. more to it than that, but uh, I can swap a different AK fire control kit in there and that kind of stuff, but. Absolutely sweet, sweet guns, man. They'll they'll keep up. They'll shoot just as fast as I can. Yeah, I've never outrun one. What magazines are you running in those things? Sometimes those magazines just look enormous. Yeah, it depends on the game I'm playing, yeah. right? So uh, when I travel overseas uh, for IPSC competition, we can only run 10 rounds in a mag. So I run 12-round SGM mags. They're a U.S.-made mag for the guns. I like the 12-rounders uh, simply because... It, they have 10 rounders and 12 rounders. Well, if we're only allowed 10 rounds, I like having a 12 rounder that's downloaded too. So I have zero spring tension. So I can just slam that mag and never worry about it spitting back out. Mm. In the US, I'll run 20 rounders, the big stick mags, or a 25 round drum. Those things, uh, you know, if I can, if I'll just run the drum. I mean, that thing's sick. Uh, 25 rounds plus one, uh, that gets most jobs done. Those yeah. are killer. Yeah, it's pretty They cool. look sweet. I love every time you post a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do love it. The back is clear too. So, uh, oh, really? When you're shooting it, you can see it just ching, 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 ching. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Watching the shells feed. It's pretty neat. Is that the gun that you were shooting over there in the World Shotgun Championships? Yeah. Yeah. So I ran, a, it's a Dissident Arms uh, KL 12, is what it is. It's a US rebuild on that Malat gun. But yeah, that's what I run for competition. The World Shotgun Championships, is, it, is that separate from three guns? So is that part of a different thing or is that? Yep. How, yep. Do, how does that work? How do you get there? Yep. So, uh, what the heck is going on with this dog? Over there? Sorry, <laughs> just a second. Yeah. So overseas, it was uh, IPSC competition. 
So it's IPSC is really like the uh, European version of USPSA. So it's just a, a different governing body than we're used to shooting with here in the U.S., but it's what the rest of the world takes really serious hmm. is the IPSC games. So slightly different rules for capacity, slightly different rules for a handful of different things from uh, stage design and from movement. And, uh, you know, there's a few things you got to learn before you go play in Europe. But So it's uh, like the soccer of competitive shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it is. There's golf claps and everything. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you qualify for that in the U.S., or did you have to go over to Europe a couple of times to get into that then? Yeah, so it's messy in the, for the U.S. The rest of the world, there's qualification for it. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., it was um, not super well defined how to actually make it on the team. It's kind of a selection board type thing. Yeah, there were a few guys that yeah. made the decision based on your previous IPSC experience, right? Mm. They did the best they could. They just you know grabbed... All right, this guy's been to seven IPSC matches. All right, he qualifies. This guy hasn't been to any. Uh, well, he's a good shooter, but uh, I don't know, right? So they they made some decisions uh, based on IPSC experience. So we didn't necessarily send the strongest teams um, because just because you've shot something doesn't mean you're the strongest at it, right? Where we've got tons and tons of U.S. talent that wanted to go. But, but that's kind of like golf, too, in a way, like... You, if you had like the world championship, like you would want to send like the people who had played golf before, so they weren't asking questions. Oh the yeah, whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. Is that yeah. kind of like what it is? I mean, kind like, of, kind of. Their their thought process on that, I would because, guess so. Because you could still go and like show up to right, like you. No, no, no. The U.S. had uh, thirty six slots. Sure. That were all dispersed from the gotcha. USPSA. So if you were not invited by them, you were not invited. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Because we had originally, you know, I didn't actually make it on Team USA because I had no experience in IPSC. And so I was a little bummed on that. I was like, okay, well, uh, I'm going to go over there and just shoot my best as an individual. Doesn't make sense. Well, it, it's a thing, but sure. it's, it is what it is. Um, and so I wanted to start my own team, right? I was like, how about I just have a, is an arms team or a vortex team why, yeah. why, why can't we do that and they're like well no it's u.s slots so i was like all right well i'm just gonna go shoot and do the best i can then played out that way it was all right you know <laughs> yeah. yeah so you rolled up and you got your two dots on your shotgun and everybody was like huh oh yeah the whole world because uh, yeah. you got guys that have been doing that for 20 years right uh, i mean like the russians and yes so how, how did this so you just showed up but you were—you said you were like uninvited. Is yeah, no. So went? there's Team USA. Yeah. And then there's U.S. shooters. Oh. Right. So okay. in open division, there was a four-person Team USA open division team. I was, it's not on that team. And then there's men's. And, and then there's men's and women's. And so then there were individuals that were like, ah, oh, you can go, but you're not on the team. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so was, that's that's where you jumped in, kind of right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, I'll, I'll go. Like, let, let's do this. Yeah, we'll go play. So yeah, you just showed up and yeah. What's that like? It was in France. I don't know if you already mentioned that, right? It was in France. Yeah, yeah. It was in Chateau or Chateau. I don't know how to say all those French words. Um, yeah, but do we? Yeah. <laughs> we don't concern you ourselves. Made it sound, <laughs> you made it sound real fancy. Did I? Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, it was about four hours south of Paris, and it was awesome. The only thing I didn't like over there is I, I don't speak French, read French. And the further you get away from like Paris, uh, the less English they speak or they're willing to speak. And so, you know, you know, I end up sitting at restaurants, looking at people's plates, trying to figure out, like, I'll just have that. I'll have it with that guy's having because I couldn't read the menu and, you know, they didn't want to communicate with us. So most of the people were friendly. Uh, it was good to go. But the match itself was one of the coolest matches I've ever been to, just with how well it was funded and how well it was run. I mean... Entry fees in the U.S. to get into a major match are like 300 bucks, right? To go to a major match, one of the biggest pro matches or whatever in the country. Over there, it was like seven. It was 650 or something like that. So double the price. So it's, it's expensive to go, but there are absolutely no expense spared. Everything's very nice. I mean, all the way from check-in and, and stuff like that. I mean, there are people that will help you carry stuff. Like, you don't reset any of the stages. Like, Whoa. it's a gentleman's game there. And so a lot of, you know, it was totally different than what I'm used to here. Are the stages set up kind of like you would see a three-gun shotgun stage? 
Is, yeah. is it kind of is yeah. it kind of like that, like barriers and? Yep, very I, similar. I very similar. It. the The only difference over there is they've run by this IPSC runs by this rule of stage size. So for every one long course, you have to have two medium courses and three short courses. So you have a mix of how big the stages are, and so you know for every one field course, which is like the traditional U.S. style three gun shotgun course you'd have four or five of these smaller courses that could be eight rounds and two shooting positions. So Hmm. it could be a four second stage where you just unload or unloaded start, slam a mag in, shoot four on one side, move quick, shoot four on another. That's a whole stage. And so your technical skills had to be super sharp on reload loads on that kind of stuff, transitions, because there was no room to make it up. Like we can make it up in us three gun. Like if you give me 30 yards, like, I can make some time up. You give me three feet, you know, you better shoot fast because there's no way to make it up. And so that was a little different style too, which was, which was fun. I do a lot of dry fire. So uh, slam and reloads and stuff is, you know, that's, that's something I'm good at. Um, so I ended up playing to my skills a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. Are most of the other folks from around the world running similar guns? Yeah. In open. Yeah. So the, uh, the Russian shotguns are the most popular thing in open. Uh, the guys from Thailand, some of them, they had the super interesting gun. So hmm. it was like an M2, except the tube, you know, the tube on the bottom, the magazine tube hmm. that you guys fill through the magazine port. These guys slam a new tube on. So like when it shoots the 10 rounds out, the old tube goes boop and drops off the gun. And they grab another <laughs> one, looks like a samurai sword, and they stick it in the front of the gun and it locks in and it auto chambers another round. Mark uh, needs one of those for goose hunting. Kind of, yeah. I was going to say, that sounds like a snow goose special <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It was a crossover. Yeah, there, there you go. Is some kind of like custom jobber? Or is oh, that yeah. something they make over there? It, it, it's for sure custom. Some custom shop puts it together, yeah. but uh, So that was interesting. But for the most part, of the top 10, I think seven or eight were uh, Russian shotguns. Okay. Yeah, so it's the, it's the gun. Was Mag- it like an even mix of... Folks there from different countries, or did did one region dominate, or was it limited per region, if you will? Yeah, so it was limited per region. So the way that they get set up the slots, that who gets to go, is basically by the size of your region. Our region is U.S. USPSA. So we have twenty six thousand members. We had thirty six slots, right? Something like that. Close. Uh, so Russia has the largest. Uh, membership of IPSIC, so they have the largest team that attends the event. And then different countries, they're really, really good at different guns and really different styles. So the Russians are super strong and open. I mean, they're the home of the open division shotgun, right? Some of the other countries uh, are really, really strong with the tube guns or pump guns or things like that. And so it was interesting to see, just based on the laws in their country, what kind of guns they're allowed to have. Okay, right. Some of them can't even have a detachable magazine shotgun. And so no one from their country is running open. They're great with tube guns, you know, or vice versa. The Russians, they don't run tube guns. Most of them don't. It's a, it's a Russian shotgun. So different countries certainly had different strengths and different sized teams based on how many members they have in IPSC. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know why in my head I just, a world shooting competition just seems so odd to me. Like shooting sports are so like ingrained in our heads here in the U.S., and I always, you know, you see like other countries and it's like, we can't even have guns in these other countries. But then it's, I guess there are some other ones, at least that you can oh, have yeah. something. Oh, if, yeah. if you can do it, they'll figure it out, you know, yeah. if you can own it. Most of them need a permit, a sporting permit uh, of some kind. So many of the members in IPSC that are in Europe have some sporting permit that allows them to have the firearms. But it's funny because of the politics. I've got a buddy that uh, is, I don't know where exactly, but somewhere in Europe. And so even his dry fire, he's wearing his jersey because he has to be in his sporting uniform when he uses his sporting guns. So he could be in his basement technically to be legal. He's got to be wearing his jersey to do his dry fire. It's like, <laughs> are you serious? Like, really? Like, that's weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not to go off topic, but I heard there was like jersey trading. Yeah. Uh, so it, the custom there, I guess. I'm going to do that this weekend. Dude, nobody in the U.S. will know what the <laughs> heck you're talking about. <laughs> so you get over there and you get in this match and all these guys, it's like this high school prom thing almost. Like where they're like, hey, you know, uh, after the match, would would you trade jerseys with me? I was like, well, would I do what? You're like, what do you want my jersey for? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't need your jersey. I'm not going to wear it. Like, 
it was just I, I didn't know how to handle that at first. So I was just like, um, maybe. Um, uh, let me think <laughs> about it. Like, it was just seriously, like a high school prom. Did they just start a piece of paper that said like <laughs> check yes or no? <laughs> you start asking people, hey, does, do you know if that person? Do you, <laughs> no, that that's like, real. They, you go talk to that person for me. <laughs> that's real. It was happening. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing. But that's the culture. One so time. apparently, it's rude to leave with your jersey when oh, you go no. to an Ipsic you, major match. Did you end up switching? I did. But the, the, the last day, I, I was like, "All right, so I guess this is a thing." And so everybody else has told me it's a thing, and it's—I don't want to be rude. So not like a snipe hunt. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll trade my jersey." Uh, there, there was an RO. Uh, That's—he was probably the coolest RO I'd ever I'd ever met. Just a huge, huge dude, and uh, happy-go-lucky, nice guy. He was talking to me before the match about Ipsic rules and how to make sure you ask the RO this or that before you do this and on a stage. And so I think it was a nice advantage that he helped and spent some time with me. So I went over and found him and I traded jerseys with that guy. You know, I was like, Hey man, you know, you were uh, helpful to me in this match and you're just a good dude. So if you want to trade jerseys and he was like, yeah, I mean, it's a big deal there. Right. So I was like, well, here you go. Let's do it. Rock on. One, one time, one time Ruben let me wear his letterman's jacket, but we just, we weren't really even shooting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice of you Rube uh, it was weird yeah <laughs> like <laughs> Mark jumped up in my truck to go to lunch one day and he slipped it on and that was weird you wear a letterman jacket <laughs> every day uh, no <laughs> <laughs> so different cultures right we go around the world and we think you know here in the US I we know the culture we, yeah. we know what to expect when we go places I'd say that's the biggest difference when I went overseas was just everything's new. They have a different way of doing things and it's totally accepted. So like when you go there and you don't know it, you're way out of place. So going off of that, I mean, most matches that I've shot three gun for a while here in the U S haven't ever done it internationally. Most matches that we're shooting are what two days, most of the time, sometimes three days. Yeah. And this is a much longer event. Yeah. It was a week. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so there was six days of shooting. Uh, you shot on five of those six, and you had a break day. And so you've got to hold it together in a match that comes down to tenths of seconds for a week. Wow. You know, 30 stages, where in the U.S., again, it's 10, right? Uh, and so that was the mental management of the match and stress level and adrenaline level and all of that stuff was certainly a learning experience just trying to stay as even as possible for six days. Not not ride any of the highs, not worry about any of the lows, just stay even and just shoot every stage for the stage itself because it was such a long match. Did you find that nutrition played into that too? Yeah, yeah. Beginning of this year, um, well, I've, I've got knee issues, right? And so I have patellar tendonitis in my knees and I went to a physical therapist and I was like, how do we fix this? Because I need, I want to, I don't want to stop shooting. And I'm, right now, I was like having to put braces on and all this stuff. He was probably the coolest, most honest physical therapist I've ever worked with. Because usually they just want to bill you, right? I mean, just generally, professionals want to bill you because that's what they do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, well, I got a foolproof plan for you, how to fix your knees. He goes, it's not going to require surgery, but you're really not going to like it. I was like, wow, what is it? Tell me already. He goes, well, um, you want to be an athlete, right? I was like, yeah, I want to be an athlete. He goes, maybe you should eat like it. I was like, whoa. Hey. <laughs> whoa. Gauntlet thrown. Yeah, I was like, oh. Uh, he goes, man, no, but seriously, he goes, you're probably 50 pounds overweight, uh, which I was. And he goes, you drop that, you're going to be explosive. You, you already talk about explosive movements being important to you because your knees aren't going to hurt. The better nutrition is going to help you keep a better mental position when you're shooting the matches. And all of that's become true, right? And I've dropped about 40 pounds since then, gotten stronger, feel better. I don't have the highs and lows through the course of a day. My energy level is solid. So yeah, nutrition this year has, has been probably the biggest advancement in my shooting career, uh, just with everything else coming along with it. Just because I'm, I'm in a position physically and mentally because of it, where, where I can just perform at the highest level. Yeah. And, and how long ago was that change then? That you, that you January. That, that January. Yeah. That's a significant. Yeah, that is. Wow. That's yeah. solid. Yeah. What, like, what were, so you talk about nutrition in general. What were, like, 
what's like a couple things that like you thought were big difference makers in there though? Yeah. So uh, again, I'm not, I don't believe, I believe in long-term change, not short-term results right. on anything and anything I do. And so I wanted to figure out, you know, I used to fight and have to cut weight and I could, I could make weight. I walked around it at like 210 and I fought at 185. So I would, you know, I know how to control my body weight. I can do that stuff. But I wanted to do something that I could do forever, that I could manage and not go crazy and all of that. And so basically I, I removed processed carbs and processed sugars from my diet after breakfast. That's pretty much it. So I eat some oatmeal and some eggs and, you know, coffee for breakfast. And then I, that's it for my like carbs, like breads and grains. And then I just eat vegetables and meat the rest of the day. So I eat awesome food. You know, I'll, I'll eat, you know, moose, I'll eat venison, I'll eat steak, I'll eat, you know, fish, chicken, and veggies the rest of the day. That's, that's pretty much my diet. And so I always have an energy. If I need something, you know, midday, I just grab some almonds or something like that. And, uh, you know, I never feel that, that crash after lunch and, you know, all right. that, that, I, that I used to just, you know going out and getting them pizza or something for lunch and just get crushed yeah, for the rest yeah. of the day. Yeah, it spikes you for a little bit and then... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then the other part too is, okay, so I, that's that's my traditional diet, but how do I stay sane? Because I love some of those grains and pastas and all that kind of stuff too. And so I shoot matches uh, once, a, once a week minimum on a local level and then once a month at least on a national level or international level, I'll fly out somewhere. And so on a, for a major match, I'll do some carb loading for about a day and a half before the match, just eating some pastas, eating some, some grains for a day or two, a little bit more before the match, and uh, just to fill my muscles with lots of good carbohydrates so that I can explode and have lots of power. And then the day before any local match, I'll do the same thing. So basically adding those grains back in, healthier grains, not processed stuff, but uh, the day before big matches or any match uh, keeps me sane. Then I, it's another reason to look forward to that match too, right? Do you have any tricks for, you know, because, you know, you talk about being on the road, right? And, you know, sometimes it's easier to, you know, you can really control what you have going on yep. at your house. Do you have any, you know, tips or tricks that you've learned along the way to, to be able to like eat better and, and, and find those foods and have those instead of, you know, other options that are maybe more convenient or what's there? Yeah, that, that part is a challenge. It can be. I always keep a bag of almonds in the car and beef jerky just in case, but that's not lunch. That's just like a snack to get you through. But you can stop at any place and you go, you know, grab, they bring you a menu and go, I want a chicken breast and vegetables. Can you do that? Right. And they'll be like, well, I got to figure out what the price is. It's like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, I'm sure it'll be fair. And that's what I'll take, you know, chicken mm -hmm. breast and vegetables. And they'll make that for you. Uh, they've got a chicken breast and vegetables or whatever in the back or a steak. You know, I like getting a steak as, as often as possible. And so, Anybody, will, they'll make you that. They'll, they got to figure out what to charge you, but that's about it, you know. And then they, they you don't have to order off the menu. You know? I'm, I'm kind of high maintenance, so <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. You get some funny looks. My wife's like, "Do you really have to order off the menu?" I'm like, "Well, no, but I want to," and they're okay with it because I'm going to give them a good tip. So, you know, whatever. There you go. No, no, no. I don't need the menu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know what I'm having. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> waitress oh, my God. oh no oh no yeah my wife will tell them at times he's gonna tip well don't worry about it yeah yeah because uh, they'll be like oh whatever there you go so how'd the match go for you i was just about to ask yeah how did it how did it end up finishing up Went well i won the match so uh i won open division world championship uh here in 2018 which was highlight of my shooting career at this point and was was certainly the goal. You know, I went over there and didn't know exactly what to expect because I've never competed with the rest of the world, you know. And some of the countries can't have centerfire rifles or pistols. They just shoot shotguns. Like, that's the whole show there. And so, you know, competing with these guys, I expected it to be a fight for sure. It's like the 1980 Olympics hockey team. Miracle. Miracle. <laughs> miracle on grass. Uh, miracle on uh, bay. I don't know if it was, a, bay. it was a miracle, but uh, <laughs> it was solid. Uh, I'd prepared I, just the way that I used to train for getting ready for fights and stuff like that, where you'd do a bunch of recon, watch a bunch of video. You'd go through and figure out what your top competitors do or what the stage designs look like or all of the style that I was going to need to prepare for. 
And then uh, I just brought that into my training and cut the other guns out. So my rifle game's a little weak right now. My pistol game's a little weak right now because I took about five months to really just crush it and, and go after that match. And so every day I was working on training with full choke, you know, shooting on the move with full choke and turkey chokes and stuff like that. So just figuring out what I'm going to need to do to be successful. And so all that, it all paid off. It all worked out. Yeah. I feel and like were you running those tighter chokes in the comp or was that to just almost like pinpoint your accuracy and then you open it up a little bit for the competition? Uh, opened it up a little bit for the competition. Um, but there were tight no shoots that we were expecting. Okay. So in Ipsic, they'll cover a target. So they'll cover half the target with a no shoot target. And so you can't actually aim at the target with a shotgun because you have to hit the edge of the, the shoot target with the pattern. Mm -hmm. So you just edge hit those targets at 25 yards with a shotgun and people are like 25 yards. Yeah. And it's half covered, you know? And so you got to run full choke and then aim into the air next to the target you want to shoot. Right. Oh. Just, just so a few BBs hit what you want to shoot and then not the no shoot. And so I expected that to be a huge part of the match. It was, but it wasn't to the level where it was a concern because of the practice that we put in. That's like when you got that hen mallard flying in front of the Drake and you kind of got a edge around them or between them yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so shotgunning it, with tight chokes like that was it was awesome and now coming back to the u.s shooting three gun with shotgun i'm like give me a heavy shotgun stage let's do it i can run an ic Woo! i'm gonna burn it down you know because you're used to shooting fast with a full choke now you throw an ic or something there and you got a two foot pattern like oh man you can go fast so that, that was a great part about the match and uh, and about how it's helped that part of my shooting game elevate simply because you just had to refine that process so much with shotgun that you just couldn't have any gaps. And so now when that comes up on a three-gun stage, I'm just pumped. I just know it'll go well. I so, still hate shotgun sections. You do? Well, maybe if you didn't have to reload, you know, and quad load, <laughs> get you an open gun. Yeah, let's get you a gun. Then you'd be set. Oh, shoot, yeah. Dude, Maybe I'm in the same position. Slam a mag in. Mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. So, Josh, you're preparing. You prepare for big events that you have, yeah. right? You focus on what you're going to be tested on, right? Yes. So you got a big PCC match coming up mm -hmm. this weekend, running that JP oh, pretty yeah. hard for the last how many weeks or months? Uh, uh, well, really about eight weeks. Sure. So I pick two or three matches a year that are my focus matches. Everything else in the middle is just it, I'm going to do my best. And so... World was the primary match of the year. That went well. Lucas is right on par with USPSA PCC Nationals. So those are my next two matches. First half of the year was shotgun. Second half of the year is PCC. And so about eight weeks of solid training, you know, wearing guns out, just shooting rounds. So uh, lots of dedicated training. And for a uh, pistol caliber carbine match, shooting 9 mil ARs, they're not like a quarter MOA gun like the 223s are, right? So they're like a three or four MOA gun. Some of them are worse than that. Mine are about three or four MOA. So you get way less forgiveness mm -hmm. on, on steel at 50 yards, right? So if you have to come up and do an offhand shot on a piece of steel at 50 yards, it's just it's like bench rest. You have to just have perfect trigger press because if you're technically aiming at the side of the steel, you could be four inches off it. So it's way less forgiving, and so lots and lots of offhand practice. Shoot two or three targets up close fast, then just nice precision shot at the end. You know, that's changing up that cadence and dialing what you need to see and what you need to do on the trigger to get those hits every time with the pistol caliber carbine is just critical. Every, anybody can hose it down, but when you get that steel out there at 50 yards that you got to do in the middle of the hose in the ray, uh, that's where it gets tricky. Working a lot on that. We were working on that this morning a little bit, right? Burn it down on paper at 25 and then a small small target that you got to really, really dial in your sight picture. They always got to throw those in, man. Everybody's always out. They're all out there having fun, shooting targets real fast, and then, you know, they just say, oh, here's one that's really hard to hit. Yeah. It's really far away. Yeah, that's the game. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just, like, pull the trigger and... Uh, really, like a crazy Really person. throwing a monkey wrench in the whole operation. Man. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, and then that that's the deal breaker. Because if you just have a hosing stage where it's 50 rounds or something like that and everything's up close, top times, top 10 times will be within about a second. Oh, yeah. Know? And so 
when you throw two or three pieces of steel out there that actually require a solid sight picture and a solid trigger press, now all of a sudden the top 10 times are maybe six seconds apart. And so that's really the match. I mean, because anybody can just crush that hose and stuff. So it, it really becomes the match is who can hit those precision shots on the first try. And if you pull it off, that's where you get your win. Yeah. yeah. That's how you win the match. Real quick, and I, I know uh, MC Ryan's over there flagging this on uh, the time a little bit before we get into the last calls. What kind of... Uh what kind of an optic are you running on the PCC? Yep. So uh, I am currently running the Razer 6 MOA micro dots. I got a couple of those on there. I'm, I just started messing You're around with... You're doing two on there also, right? Yeah. So yeah. is there like an open PCC and... Nope. Open uh, PCC is open. It is open. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then I uh, just started messing with the UH-1. So I've got one of those on one of my practice guns. I like the huge window. So uh, it might be something that I transitioned to. I wasn't ready yet for this match, but... The big window and clear glass all the way out to the outside, man, that thing is nice. So I like that dot. Uh, I can't a, run two of those really with one of them. No, no, so I, yeah, that would be a little, be weird. a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking uh, long term solution might be UH1 up and down, straight up, primary optic, and then uh, Razor 6 MOA offset. Uh, that's the way my practice gun's set up, and I'm really liking it. So that may be something. Sweet. Yeah. What do you say we jump into last calls here? I'm ready. Ready? Who wants to go first? Mark? I'll go. You were the only one to say you were ready, so. <laughs> Man, I'll say, uh, Josh, awesome having you here. I've definitely uh, learned a few things along the way, just because, as we touched on earlier, I've been admittedly abstinent from the three-gun <laughs> world. Um, so, yeah, my last call is uh, I've been inspired. I'm going to check it out. Let's do it. Are you actually going to build an AR now? I've got, like, 99.9%. <laughs> Of it, ready to rock. Our AR is ninety nine point nine percent air. Must be. <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent. My last call isn't. Uh, it, it's probably. I think I just woke up here uh, again because this puppy behind me has been keeping me up all night. But you won World Open Shotgun Championship, Josh. Right? It, yeah. I didn't miss that, did I? No. I think we just kind of like glazed over it. Like, well, well, I won, but. That's pretty sweet. How many people, I, I got to ask you, how many people were like competing in that? So the match was about 670 people. The open division, I think, was 250, something like that, the top 250 shooters in the US, in the world. Okay, so in the, of the top 250 shooters in the world, of which, what did you say, 20 some odd thousand are in the U.S. and only 36 got invited or something crazy like that? Yeah. You won. Yeah, gold medal. Yeah. And overall win. Yeah. And some dude got your jersey. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, awesome. I, yeah, was that was cool. I get that was just my last call because I had to reiterate the fact. Yeah, that's pretty freaking cool. Congratulations! Thank, thank yeah, you. congrats. Thank you. On to you, and and I guess we didn't even intro the, the last calls. Just follow your heart. Yeah, no, I'm a fan. I, I've checked out the show, so I'm familiar. All right, um, excellent. So I'd say what I thought about this time that we were spending together that was cool about it was I know that there's a huge part of the Vortex following that's not a competition shooter, right? I mean, that's a thing. Lots of hunters, lots of great 2A uh, supporters, lots of folks out there that are very like-minded but don't participate in the competition games yet. And uh, th I'd just like to throw out an invitation to anybody that's into guns that wants to come out and play. You will find that when you come to the range, it's welcoming. People will support you to get you up to speed, and you'll have a great time. It's a great community. So if you're out there and you've been thinking about, you know, how to put a little bit more time on the range that's interesting and you want to, you know, something that's dynamic, fast paced, that you want to have a good time, come on out, shoot some three gun with us, shoot some USPSA with us, whatever the game is, and, uh, and you won't regret it. I'll add one quick thing to that because the last podcast I think we recorded, if I remember incorrectly, was with Nephi from the state of Wyoming, he used to work with uh, the governorship out there in the state of Wyoming. And he explained that there is essentially, and there, it's been this way for a long, long time, there's a, a tax, I guess, which a lot of times people get mad about, but you, you wouldn't necessarily get mad about this one. Anything firearm related, and, and I might be saying this wrong, but like if you buy a, a rifle yeah, the, or... The Pittman Robertson. Yeah, exactly. There is a small amount that goes towards... Oh, shoot. Well, it, it's basically like... Essentially conservation. Conservation, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So if you're into hunting and you're into the Second Amendment and all those things, you know, and you get into three gun and you're and you're getting more three gun gear and stuff like that, just think of it as you're supporting conservation, all the things that we love. 
in this industry. So I like the three it. gun folks out there with all the gear they get, shoot. We're really supporting. You guys should have like a national yeah. park named after yourself or something. Yeah, Three Gun National Park. I'd, I'd go there. <laughs> I'd go there. Anyway, Ruben. Oh, my last call. Well, I mean, I followed Josh since before he was a Vortex ambassador, and um, the one thing that has always stuck in my mind with him, at least as a shooter and as a person, is he's a goal setter and a goal achiever, and it's really fun to watch. So. I guess my my last call is to people who don't follow Josh to go follow him because um, whether it be Facebook or Instagram or or the other outlets that he uses, um, you want to watch a cool story of somebody who sets a goal and does whatever it takes to achieve it. That's a really cool one to watch. You know, in the hunting industry, you have guys like Steve Ranella, right? Like they're kind of the they're a very big voice of for that community and and for the competitive shooting industry. Josh is one of those voices, so you will not be disappointed at the content that you see. And you might just get inspired to get out and shoot a little bit more and find out that competing really makes you a better shooter. And it's not all about, you know, winning a match. It's you might as a, as a hunter, which is a big part of my background, like being involved in competitive shooting has made me a better shot overall in general, just better with a firearm. And it has made me a more ethical hunter. And so that that's a big thing for me is like, I've noticed that whether it be waterfowl hunting or big game hunting, like the shots that we're taking now on animals have become so much easier now that I'm putting a lot of reps behind my guns. So that's my last call. I like it. Well, hey, that's great. Josh, thanks again for coming on the uh, the podcast here. And to everybody listening, thank you for listening as always. Really happy hunting. Those last calls pretty much summed everything up perfectly. So everybody, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you could take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.